So welcome, everybody. This is a very exciting day because we're uh, traveling across the Atlantic to Wales, and we're going to learn a lot about Wales, but we're going to also get to know one of its famous citizens of this century. We're talking today to Sophie Howe. From 2016 to 2023, Sophie was the world's first commissioner of future generations, or future generations commissioner. And they called her the world's first minister for the unborn. And she's done so much since then and during that time. Talk about starting small and snowballing. She was named one of UK's top 100 change makers and number five in the woman's in the BBC Woman's Powerless. We love powerful women. Welcome <laughs> to the podcast, Sophie. Thanks for having me. Hey, listen, it's a little intimidating because you are a bit of a media darling. I have seen your <laughs> podcast all over. And um, I think we can jump right into some juicy stuff because I think you'll agree that you're a wellness seeker too, don't you think? I am definitely a wellness seeker and um, and a, a and a well-being everyone's seeker, I think I would describe myself. There you go. Well, I just think we have to set the stage with Wales. Do you know, I kept thinking when I found you were from Wales, I was like, where did I just see a cartoon animation of what Wales is? And it was that Ryan Phillips Wexham soccer program (laughs) on Apple TV. They actually went through the history of Wales and did um, an animation of, you know, what it really is. So, Let's set the stage. Where is Wales and isn't it just a neighborhood in England? Ah, no, definitely not. So it's um, a country in its own right. Um, If you're looking at a map of the United Kingdom, it's the kind of um, blob, if you like, on the right hand. Gosh, no. See, I'm I'm sure I'm right and left, left dyslexic on the left hand side, on the left hand side. (laughs) Um, so, and yes, yeah, so back in 1999, um, there, the first Welsh parliament and Welsh government was created following a, a referendum. So, um, the Welsh government holds powers over most things. Um, it's easier to say what they don't hold power over. So, uh, what's retained at the UK government. So that's things like defense and foreign policy and, uh, and things like that. But all of the things that are responsible for keeping us healthy and well, perhaps other than kind of social security and so on. So our healthcare system, our education system, community policy, all of those things, um, are the responsibility of, of Wales. And the other thing about Wales is it's really rich in beautiful natural environment. It actually has um, a really fast growing industry in terms of, you know, outdoor pursuits and adventures some really cool uh, things in Wales. Um, and it also has a very heavy industrial history. So the first million pound check for coal was signed um, in Wales. And that's a big part of our history. Um, but we're now trying to move um, into the um, into the next century, I suppose, in terms of being part of that kind of low carbon revolution. Well, I will tell you, I've learned so much. Um... You have your own parliament, your own language. True or false? Yeah. The letters, these are a few true or falsers. Yeah. A, Q, V, and Z are not in the Welsh, Welsh language. Is that right? They, they, are, not. they no, are not. They are not. There are four times the amount of sheep <laughs> than people in Wales. Is that right? I think that, yeah, I think that probably is still right. We are known, we are known for sheep. Um, I, I mean, there's none in my garden. Um, but you know, I probably only have to go maybe about 10 miles up the road to find sheep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wales has, true or false, Wales has the most castles in one country than either, on the, any other place in the world. True. Yeah, I think that, I think that is right. I got married in one of them, in fact. Oh, you, um, you're so cool. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Is true or false, most of the country a national park? Yes. Massive amounts of the country are a national park, um, and we're doing some really interesting and cool things with our national parks in terms of kind of a focus around well-being and wellness and the health benefits of being outdoors and um, and so on. And that a lot of that is through our Future Generations Act. Well, here's another thing that I found so shocking: um, Wales is around the size of the Netherlands, similar to the size of Slovenia and slightly smaller than the U.S. state of New Jersey. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. 
So we're going to focus on that small. Can small be big? That's one of the themes of our conversation. Uh Um, And my favorite, because I live in Los Angeles, some of the famous folks from Wales. You you do one and I'll do one. You do one of the most famous that Americans would know. Um, Gareth Bale, if you're into soccer. Oh, there you and go. He a soccer lives around the corner from me. Well, it's oh, Mary around the corner from me. Yeah. You're so cool. Okay, yeah. I'll go next. Richard Burton. Ooh, Tom Jones. There you go. Very true. Dylan Thomas. Oh, I was gonna say that one. Shirley Bassey. Shirley Bassey. Who no one would ever think that? Anthony Hopkins. Michael Sheen. Michael Sheen. Okay, I yeah. didn't know. And then we we know. Miss Zorro, Zorro herself, Catherine Zeta Jones. Uh, indeed, yes. See, I don't think we realize this. And then, of course, the Prince and Princess of Wales. And I found even found out why they have to be that. I think it was something to do in the 1300s or something. The king didn't want Wales to secede or whatever, so he named his son the Prince of Wales. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, it's a bit of a. It's it's one of those tricky issues here in in Wales. Um, you know, there's a lot of love for the royal family, but then there's a mm, people aren't that keen on um, the history that brought the Prince of Wales uh, role into being. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it's so complex when you get to the UK. But, you know, this is not really a trivia podcast about Wales, but I think that background leads us to set the stage for why is Wales the kind of place that would be the first country in the world to have a future generations commissioner? Why do you think? Well, I think Wales has got quite a progressive uh, history, I suppose. Um, We often do things quite differently to the rest of the UK. I think, um, you know, there's a sense, a real sense of community in Wales. And, you know, you can even say that in lots of places, but it's the sort of place that people come and say, oh, everyone's really friendly. Everyone, everyone talks to everyone and, um, and so on. And I think that, you know, you start off at that, you know, there's a sense of community. And I think that that spreads actually to this sense of um, our role is to look after everyone. It's, you know, a kind of bigger society role rather than, you know, we're all looking after ourselves as um, as individuals. And that's led to some quite progressive social policy, including um, legislating to protect the interests of future generations um, and, you know, appointing a future generations commissioner, which was my role to, um, to make sure that the government does that. Yeah. And I mean, you had been called the commissioner of the unborn, um, <laughs> but, you know, the Global Wellness Institute which is the Global Wellness Summit's sister organization, has that initiative, the first thousand days, to really Absolutely. emphasize mm-hmm. the health of the parents before they conceive and then all during pregnancy. But I would say mm-hmm. you could call yourself the commissioner of the unconceived, right? <laughs> <laughs> Way absolutely before. that. Yeah, absolutely that. And um, I'm a big fan of the first thousand days uh, work. And I, you know, it's so, so important. But you're absolutely right. All of the conditions that kind of, you know, lead up to people having children um, are really significant. So issues like, you know, are you living in poverty? Can you put food on the table? Um, you know, your educational attainment, that's, of course, is linked to um, to poverty as well. And uh, there are these patterns, you know, educational attainment tends to follow the parents' educational attainment. Obviously, that plays into what type of job you're going to get, what type of life you're going to live, how healthy you're going to be, and what access do you have to the things that help to keep you well. So all of this is so interconnected. Um, and this is why, you know, my passion, what we're trying to do here in Wales is to look at that at a societal level and work out how can we create policy which gives everyone the best start in life, no matter what their background. Well, I also think it would be good to just review. I know you refer to seven goals, I think. Mm-hmm. Would you mind just reviewing? And I know you always do, but for our listeners that might not mm-hmm. be familiar, what are the seven goals of the Future Generations Commission, you might say? Yeah. So these are seven goals that are set out in our law, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And essentially what they do is set out a vision for the Wales that we want to leave behind to our children, our grandchildren and future generations to come. And they were co-created with citizens. So we had this national conversation where we posed that question. It was called the Wales We Want. Uh, And citizens came up, you know, it's quite interesting because often when governments have, you know, dialogue with citizens, 
Um, it's not usually in terms of those open, really open questions like what matters to you, what's important to you, what you want to leave behind. Um, and when you get people into that space, you know, they come up with things like they were talking about uh, our natural assets and resources in Wales. We really need to protect them. But actually, we were doing quite a lot of damage to them. They were talking about this sense of community, um, safe, attractive, well-connected communities. They were talking about the importance of our language, our culture and our heritage, passing that on to the next generation. And actually, um, the Welsh language is now one of the fastest growing minority languages. That they is so about- shocking to me. You And I, I heard you say that you the goal is a million people speaking Welsh yes. yeah. in the next okay. how long? Um, by 2050, and it's uh, but that's of a population of um, just over 3 million. Yeah, so a third wow. of the population. Yeah. Fabulous. So, and it's, you know, and, and it is happening. So I'm a, I'm not a fluent Welsh speaker, but my children are all fluent. Um, and it's gr- it's a growing language and people feel really passionate about it. And I think there is something in terms of that, both societal well-being and individual well-being. You know, when you connect with your sense of culture and your heritage and you feel part of a community, that's really good for your health. Um, The World Health Organization data tells us that, and maybe we'll get onto that in a minute. But just to complete the seven goals, so we've got um, a prosperous Wales, a healthier Wales, a Wales of cohesive communities, a resilient Wales, which is about our ecological resilience, nature and biodiversity, um, a more equal Wales, a Wales of vibrant culture and thriving Welsh language, and a globally responsible Wales. There we are. Did anyone add those up? Is that seven? I don't know. I think it is. But I will tell you that it just covers the gamut of you talk about a whole society, a healthy society. I mean, we could pick at them, but one that really is delightful to me, we mentioned Dylan Thomas and, you know, song I read is so important in Wales. Um, So what, why would you think you'd have the nerve to include culture in these future, what we're saving for the future? Why, why is that so important? Because I think that, you know, it, it, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, a late addition into the things that people said were important. It was right up there um, at the top. And I think people um, feel really proud of their culture. Um, they feel particularly proud of their language. There are some, uh, you know, lots of things that people learn through culture that perhaps they might not learn in a kind of formal uh, education system. And if we look at cultures across the world, so I've just been spending some time in um, in New Zealand um, mm-hmm. with, um, with some iwi, that's the a Maori word for tribe. Um, and the Maori culture um, is really interesting in that it does have this long-term perspective. It very much tests the things that they do within their tribes in terms of not just how is this going to play out for me and my generation, but how is it going to play, play out for next generations? And in a lot of cultures around the world um, of indigenous people, that long-term thinking um, is really embedded. Um, and I think there's something really interesting in that. And there are some things in the Welsh language which give us kind of pointers to that as well. So a word, hiraith, which means, well, it can't actually be directly translated, translated but it almost means like a sense of belonging and um you know love for your home um your home and then when we say in wales um you know i have a car um we'd say my car there is a car with me so we don't own things we have things with us which we pass on um to the next generation so ours to use perhaps whilst we're here but it's not ours to um to decimate if you like so i think there's some really interesting principles if you dig into the language and the culture the other point you one of your goals is prosperous wales but what so many of your interviews interviewers were so impressed with is that's not GDP. That isn't just growth for growth's sake. You know, whenever I hear the consumer reports and they're like, oh, buying, consumer buying is down, da, da, da. Well, good. We have enough junk. What are you doing? We just can't even get rid of what we have. So how does prosperity uh, come to play? Then. Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. Um, we define prosperity in our law in Wales as a productive, innovative, low carbon society, one which uses resources efficiently and proportionately, including acting on climate change, and which develops a well educated population with the skills to enable them to access decent work. So you just pick those things out. Basically, what we're saying is, you know, uh, within planetary boundaries, 
that is what how the economy should be defined. And that is part of the problem of, you know, this is why we're in this climate catastrophe at the moment, because, um, you know, the economy is trumped or growth, economic growth has trumped almost everything else. Um, and, you know, in Wales, we are using... Uh, we, you know, we're trying to change this, but we've been using two and a half times the planet's resources. It's actually worse in the um, in the UA, US, or actually, you know, our fair share of the world's resources, and we can't just continue to do that. So that's where we say. Um, we need an economy within planetary boundaries and we need an economy that actually works for people, not people who are working for the economy. So we want people to thrive and we want the economy to be part of helping them to do that, not the other way around. How revolutionary. People first, planet <laughs> first. How dare yeah, you? Absolutely. And, um, also uh, equality. I know you worked a lot with diversity early on in your career. Mm-hmm. So how does equality come to play? So one of our goals, the More Equal Wales, basically says no matter what your background, um, you know, you should have um, equal equal chances. And that is absolutely right. And we know, sadly, that that's not the case. That's not the case for Black, Asian, minority ethnic people. It's not the case for, uh, for women and disabled people and so on. And um, again, through this conversation that we had with citizens, people felt that that was really important. We wanted Wales to be more equal. So we've made quite a lot of strides. So we've got more women than men in our um, in our cabinet, in our in our government. Um, we were one of the first gender balanced parliaments in the in the world. That's gone slightly backwards now, annoyingly. Um, we are the first of the UK nations to have black history as a mandatory part of the school curriculum, because really we were only teaching white history. And then we're wondering why there's this, um, you know, perhaps unconscious racism or a lack of understanding and um, and so on. And lots of different things happen in Wales as a, a nation of sanctuary. So for people seeking asylum from other parts of the world, and that plays back to our goal of a globally responsible world because, or a globally responsible Wales, because we believe that we shouldn't just be global consumers. And, you know, we have been take, take, take from other parts of the world, much like most of the global north have been. Actually, it's our duty to, um, to pay some of that, to pay some of that back. You'll see me taking notes all the time. It's my old college days. Whenever smart people talk, (laughs) I take notes. I can't help it. But in that sanctuary point, do you see that one of the reasons language is growing is people that have come as refugees learn Welsh? Are they Mm -hmm. doing that? Well, they are doing that. And really interestingly, um, when we took um, we took refugees uh, most recently, I suppose, from Afghanistan and, of course, from Ukraine. And I've hosted um, two Ukrainian uh, refugees in um, in my home. Um, But. We had a government-sponsored program where they were actually hosted in um, the facilities of of an organisation called the IRTH, and that is a young people's Welsh language organisation. So they do loads of cool things. You know, my kids go to their football clubs and their rugby clubs and their dance clubs and all of these different things. They have holiday camps in different places and so on. But the refugees were actually housed there and started to learn Welsh as well. Um, And I think there's just something really lovely about that. So embedding um, people, you know, who fleed, uh, you know, persecution and terror from other parts of the world, embedding them in that Welsh language and culture is just, yeah, feels quite special to me. So so cool. So much fun. Now, before we jump to my favourite topic, which is Mm -hmm. climate, I was gobsmacked by some of your thoughts about education, Sophie. And we will get to your five children. Like, do you remember their names? How busy are you? Five (laughs) children. I can't. It sometimes feels like I'm raising half the future generations. (laughs) Amazing. But um, what about education? I mean, people should hear this because it just, the word that just keeps coming to mind of what you said is critical thinking. Train them. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So as part of the requirements of the Future Generations Act, it basically requires us to test everything that the government and all of our public institutions, everything they do in line with how is it going to meet those seven long term wellbeing goals and how is it applying long term thinking, looking at the future trends and scenarios um, in the future. And of course, one of the most important areas for us to do that is how our kids are educated in schools. And I don't know about you, but 
when I was in school. Um, and in fact, my eldest child, he's 24. And it was very much, I used to tear my hair. I think, my God, you still learn it? Like literally almost the same lessons he was receiving as I can remember having. But it was rote learning. Um, there wasn't a massive interest in whether you like loved school or didn't love school. You just had to go through school and you had to um, do your exams at the end of it. And your exams were about what you could remember and regurgitate in a, in a two hour exam. And we were still teaching our kids like this. Well, if you think of the way in which the world of work, let alone, you know, the world of life has changed. Um, you know, when do you do stuff in work where, you know, you're not collaborating with people and you're not bouncing ideas um, off each other? And you're not um, allowed to talk to your neighbor at school. Oh, no, 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 no. Put your head down and do your work. Right? Exactly. Utterly crazy. Utterly crazy. What do we what, what do we do if we want to know something? We don't hold it all up there. We, we Google it, don't we? You know, that's that's kind of what we do now. So our education system, not just in Wales, but similar education systems across the world are failing our young people in not equipping them for the skills that they need um, for later life. As I said, not just for a job, but also if we think about some of the um, long term, quite worrying trajectories that we're seeing with young people, really significant increases in poor mental health. There was a study out in the UK last week which looked at girls in particular lowest levels of self-esteem ever um you know there's some w- really worrying things we've got these increasing rates of obesity so in wales and you know i imagine it's uh, similar in the us 56 percent of um adults um are overweight or obese and that is obviously not good for individuals but that is also a massive societal catastrophe so how do we get right up front um, of all of that well of course the education system is part of it so we reformed our curriculum we based it around four key pillars so all of the the um, what we call areas of learning which would be subjects to to you and I are taught through the lens of these four pillars and they are creating ambitious and capable learners so that's basically saying We need our kids to have a love of learning because um, lifelong learning is going to have to become the new norm. It's not the case anymore that you'd learn your skill, go into your job, stay in that job for life and, um, you know, retire when you're 65 or or whatever. And there's going to be constant changes all the time. So we're going to need to have that love of learning instilled. Um, creative and enterprising citizens. So far from the creative arts and the creative subjects being the add-ons, the nice to do if there's time in the school day, actually they are absolutely core because um, what do we need to focus on? The things that make us human and the things that robots can't do. Robots are not creative. We want humans to have that creativity, perhaps working alongside AI and robotics and so on, but we want to focus on those skills. Then healthy, active and confident individuals. This is about recognising that our physical and mental health um, should be a core part of what we learn in school and is as important, if not more important than anything, any knowledge that we might um, acquire. And then the final principle, which is my favourite, ethical and informed citizens. So this is basically, uh, you know, teaching our kids what is their place in the world and where, you know, where can they make impact? Um, what sort of impact don't shouldn't they be making, for example, in terms of their carbon footprint? Um, and what's the positive impact that they can make globally? And I kind of feel that if everyone in the world had been through a curriculum with an aim to make us ethical and informed citizens, would we be in the middle of this climate catastrophe? Oh. Would we have this wealth inequity and so on? Maybe not. So I'm a big fan of the curriculum. Well, I am too. And I just found out about it. But I will just tell you that this goes hand in hand with, I'm sure you heard that Lancet did a study of 10,000 people, I think it's age 16 to 25. And it just showed that most young people are extremely worried about uh, Mm -hmm. the climate. They call it climate anxiety. And they just feel like humanity is doomed. So what would you say to those anxious children? What would you say? So I think that there's um, a real challenge with that because I totally understand that anxiety and almost the feeling of hopelessness because they're not generally in these positions of power where they can influence um, decision making. It's almost like they're sitting, you know, perhaps they're having, you know, like when you have a kind of out of body experience, you can kind of see something happening, but you can't quite, um, you know, do anything about it. And it, it, it must feel like that's 
for them. You know, politicians taking the wrong decisions again and again and again because they're short-term decisions and young people can see how that's going to stack up in terms of their future. So I think they do feel let down. However, I don't think that pessimism is going to take us through this or get us out of this crisis. So I think that we have to have a degree of optimism. And that's where I think the long-term well-being goals, which is the vision for, for what we want in Wales, is really important because generally when we talk about the future, it's dystopian. You know, imagine the Netflix dramas, you know, there's killer you know, bugs on the loose and there's, you know, an AI gone mad and there's, you know, a catastrophic, you know, um, meteor collision and nuclear disaster and so on. You and a dog and a little kid are the only things left on the planet, right? (laughs) You know, it's just grim. But so we need to give people, you, you know, a hope in terms of what they're working for, working towards. And that's essentially what we have in Wales, which is bizarre because we're the only country in the world that has a long-term vision set out in law. Now, you know, I say that again, the utter madness of no other country having a long-term vision. The vision tends to be whatever the parliamentary, uh, you know, election cycle is. In Wales, it's five years, but we've got this longer, um, you know, thing set out in law. I was in um, Vermont this week where they're on two-year cycles. How on earth any yeah, how anyone gets anything done in two years. And it's no wonder that short-term decisions are are prime then because it's just about what's going to get me elected next time. So for young people, they are utterly frustrated with that system. But I do think we need to give them hope and optimism. And part of the way of doing that is to then involve them in the decisions that are taking uh, being taken, which is exactly what we're seeking to do in Wales. We've got an elected youth parliament. We've lowered the voting age to 16. We've got a Future Generations Leadership Academy who You've are... You've lowered the voting age to 16 already? We have, yeah. yeah we have. are you? I'm moving. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> oh, my God. I can actually, you know, flip it and say that you're a minister of hope, or you were for nine years. And what you continue to do is instilling hope. Give us some more concrete evidence that that hopefulness is worth it. Uh, what are some of the programs that were instituted in Wales? Tell me a little bit about that. No more roads. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So this, I suppose, was like the first big test of the legislation. So my role, I wasn't part of government. My job was to be outside of government and critiquing government policy, if you like, be in the conscience of future generations. So the government had this plan, which had been on the books for ages and finally was coming to fruition, that they wanted to spend the entire of their borrowing capacity building a 13-mile stretch of motorway to deal with the problem of congestion around one um, one of our cities. Now, Every, you know, practically every city in the world will recognise that issue. All of our cities are congested. Um, we never really deal with the problem. Um, the only way we're going to deal with the problem is for to encourage modal shifts. So that's help to get people out of their cars, have better public transport, um, better routes for walking, cycling, um, and so on. And it's not just about the congestion. It's also about the air pollution that comes from that and the thousands and thousands of deaths that result um, from that air pollution. It's about the accidents that occur in these um, in these busy streets. It's about our street scene and the feel of communities that are filled with cars versus, um, you know, car free free streets, which are um, much better communities to live in. So on that issue, I intervened as commissioner and I asked the government to explain to me how they'd applied the Future Generations Act to that decision. Please explain to me how it's in line with that goal of a prosperous Wales, which remembers talks about a low carbon society using resources efficiently and proportionally and acting on climate change, how it applied to the goal of a resilient Wales, which is about enhancing, maintaining our ecosystems and nature. It was going to go right through one of our major na- nature reserves. Um, how it's in line with the goal of a healthier Wales, because we've got these illegal levels of air pollution, we've got increasing rates of obesity. How is creating, spending the entire of the borrowing capacity on something which is going to encourage more of us to sit in our cars for longer, um, going to address that. And then how is it in line with the goal of a more equal Wales? Because um, 25% of the lowest income families um, don't even own a car. 
So we'd be spending all of that money on something which benefited the already better off. And if I'd seen this stat, which I just read today, actually, um, it would have played into the goal of a cohesive Wales, because I read a study today in another part of the UK that looked at the difference in the in friendships, it's really interesting, between people who lived in quiet roads versus people who lived on busy main roads. Wow. And people who lived in busy main roads had 75% less friends. Now, it kind of blows your mind to think, right, wow. But you can sort of see it, can't you? Because Mm -hmm. those busy roads, you're not going to be walking along them as readily as you um, might be in your quiet suburbs. You're not going to be interacting with your neighbours. And, you know, there's probably not going to be some nice little shops around there and and so on. So basically, on that issue, um, I intervened. It was considered that it was going to be a done deal that the road was built. I asked the government to show me their workings out um, they struggled to show me their workings out. The first minister changed his mind and, and said, you know, in all honesty, we can't really, you know, stack this up in line with the Future Generations Act. Um, and since then, I've intervened further to say, OK, I want to see your workings out for all of your road building schemes, because on the one hand, you've declared as a government and a parliament that we're in a climate emergency, which is a, you know, a great statement to make. But if you're going to declare that, if you're going to make a point of declaring it, we don't just want the sound bite. We want to actually see what you're doing differently. So show me how your spending is in line with that climate emergency. And what I can see in your budget is that you're spending two thirds of your infrastructure investment budget building more roads. So explain those to me as well. Um, so they set up a review to look at all of the pre-approved road building schemes. Um, 55 of them and 51 have now been cancelled. Um, just this week, um, actually, and it's very controversial as part of this whole new transport strategy for Wales, which is prioritising people over cars. So walking and cycling is at the top of what we call our transport hierarchy. Um, we've lowered uh, the speed limit uh, across the entire of Wales to 20 miles an hour. What? Um, so that is, you know, that is thoroughly unpopular in with some people. And there's something there around this sort of bravery and decision making in terms of what is the future that we're trying to create? Is the future more roads, more cars, more roads, more cars, more roads, more cars? Because that's what happens when we build more roads, we more cars fill them. Or is it about reprioritizing human and planetary health and shifting some of the ways that we've always done things? Oh my gosh. So rather than speeding down the road, you go slow enough that you could see a biker or a walker or whatever. The yeah. other thing that I love is somehow one of the things you did, you instituted to fight loneliness and to fight garbage, you might say, is a repair <laughs> repair cafe. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, this is, I suppose, the way of this systems thinking so essentially the the duties that what the law requires us to do is whatever your starting point whatever problem it is you're trying to solve or new policy you're trying to put forward how can you do that thing in a way which makes the biggest contribution to each seven of the well-being goals and we don't tend to see that in government and in public policy because it's generally very siloed doesn't join the dots between other things but what we know is that Everything is connected to to everything. And if we're not alive to that, we can either inadvertently or inadvertently be doing damage in other areas whilst trying to solve a problem over here, or we can miss opportunities to, you know, to maximize the impact of the things that we're doing. So that's exactly the approach that we took in terms of um, how we want to be a zero waste nation. So Wales is third in the world. Another interesting fact in uh, about Wales, Wales is third in the world for its rates of recycling. So that's... Isn't it amazing? Cool. Um, but we're saying it's not good enough that we think that we can just keep consuming, 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 because then we can recycle it. Or actually, we need to reduce our, our use in the first place. We need to move to a circular economy. So Wales set an aspiration to be a zero waste nation by 2050. Now, um, you could probably do that with some innovative um, you know, technological solutions. And of course, that is all um, part of it. But if you're thinking about, OK, how do I reduce waste whilst also uh, increasing equality, improving equality, um, uh, improving cohesive communities, for example, um, 
the solutions, some of the solutions that the government are now implementing are things like, um, well, it's called the Library of Things, or the Welsh word is called the Welsh word for that, which is benthig to borrow. And that basically means you can go along, they're setting up in all communities now, and you can go along and you can borrow the stuff that we all have in our garages and our attics that we might only use once a year. So a light, your lawnmower and a paint stripper and a tent if you wanted to go camping. A whole plethora of things, like you would go and borrow a book from a library, oh but you can God. go and borrow things. Now, why is that? Why does that relate back to this zero waste mission and broader? Well, because if we've all got them in our garages, they've all taken planetary resources to produce each and every one of them. Um, at some point, they will all end up in landfill, um, you know, polluting the planet in, in that way. And you can only actually own those things if you can afford to own those things. So there's an equity issue there. And actually, if we can bring people together in a community to borrow those, those things, that's really good for connecting communities, connecting people. And then added to that, we've got repair cafes where often retired people, you know, engineers, um, you know, mechanics, those sorts of people are volunteering. Um, people can take along their broken phones, microwaves, what, whatever it might be, and get it repaired for free, which is saving that product for landfill, and they're having a nice community interaction at the same time. I'm just so uh, in love with that idea. You know, my husband loves to work with his hands. He should have been Geppetto and have a little shop. <laughs> he works with computers. But anyway, lately, his latest hobby is stripping shoes and making them just look like a million bucks. Wow. So, I need to meet him. I know. It's so, I don't even know. It's called mirroring the toe. I don't even know. But yeah. he has every kind of dye, every kind of brush. And, you know, since our son moved out, he's 23, we don't have as many kids visiting. So mm -hmm. now they're kind of coming back because they're bringing their shoes and saying to my husband, mm -hmm. like, hey, great. I'm glad that, that you're doing that. So it's cool. speaking of that, um, the starting small thing, you know, I often yell at that same husband and say, quit buying plastic uh, de detergent containers. Use mm -hmm. these sheets. What are you doing? And he's like, would you get off my back? What difference does one person make? Well, mm -hmm. let's just talk about that. It seems like with uh, your position as being first in the world, there's been a bit of a ripple effect. Finland, Lithuania. And now the UN, is that right? Yes, there's um, there's lots of countries who are taking interest in what we've been doing in Wales. I suppose the most significant is uh, the UN. So Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work with him during my term as commissioner. Um, and he proposed uh, about two years ago that the UN should um, adopt a, a UN declaration for future generations. And he is intending to appoint um, a UN special envoy for future generations, which is, I suppose, the UN equivalent of my role. And I think that, you know, that has the potential. So it's all in train at the moment where there's going to be a summit of the future uh, next year where all of this will be finalised. But I suppose, you know, Wales is a very small nation, about 3.3 million people. We don't even have a seat around the UN table because we're part of the UK for those purposes. But I think it just goes to show what small states and nations can do. And actually, when we look across the globe, it's often these small uh, nations and states who are leading the charge on this. So um, we talked about Lithuania, who just had a big national um, dialogue on, the on their future with their citizens. Um, we can see Jacinda Ardern um, with her well-being budget when she was prime minister in, uh, in New Zealand. The work that's going on uh, focusing on well-being policy in Finland. Scotland have just committed to have a Future Generations Act. There's a private members bill in the Irish Parliament. The Balearic Islands, which are just off Spain, Mallorca and Menorca, places like that, just passed a Future Generations Act. Um, there's some really interesting things uh, going on with some of the small nations. And I think there's something about these league of small and awesome nations, perhaps showing the rest of the world the direction of travel. I I am so thrilled by that. And, you know, you're taking your message all around. I know you've spoken in Australia, Romania. Soon you're going to speak in Qatar with the Global Wellness Summit. Um, tell me, we've got to go back to your origin story, Sophie, because we want to inspire other women, young women, older women, that they can kick it and make a difference. And I found out that you and I have something in common, Sophie. 
We are the both the first in our families, aunts, uncles, cousins, to ever go to university. Is that ah, right? We are there. Yes, that is right. That is right. Um, and I think that I grew up in quite a tough part of Cardiff, the capital city of, of Wales, one of those places that is often in the headlines for the wrong reasons. One of those places where actually the first thousand days needs a huge focus mm-hmm. because high levels of worklessness, um, we, we've actually made a, a big difference on this, but high levels of teenage pregnancy, high levels of poverty, that means um, high levels of you know poor eating and food quality, low levels of educational attainment. But actually, both my parents worked, which was quite unusual for that area back in the 1980s, when levels of employment in the UK were really, really high. And by virtue of the fact that they worked, I actually went to school in a more affluent area where my grandparents lived because they used to pick me up after school. And what has always stuck with me throughout my career is um, the difference between the kids that I played with on the street um, outside my house versus the kids that I played with in school, the different levels of aspiration where university was, you know, absolutely the norm that, you know, everyone was going to university and the kids on the street, university wasn't even in their, you know, sphere of thinking at all. The um, accessibility that um, those two different groups had to resources, to after school clubs, to opportunities um, and that really sticks to me. And I suppose the driving thing throughout my entire career has been it shouldn't, you know, where you're born shouldn't determine your life chances. And I suppose in this role as Future Generations Commissioner, what we're saying is when you're born shouldn't determine your life chances. And that's a really big issue for the entire world, because this generation of, of kids, younger kids at the moment, are the first generation that are going to fare worse than their parents. And that's a damning indictment on, um, you know, politicians, decision makers so far. So we need to flip that. We need to flip it. And uh, my favorite podcast, the New York Times Daily, just talked yesterday about the aspirations for going to college are changing, which has a ripple effect to how to run the world in the future. It's really, really crazy. Um, Do you think um, instead, let's see. Why do you think you had the courage? You were a deputy deputy police and crime commissioner for South Wales. Now that could be depressing. You worked to tackle violent crime and violence against women and girls, um, focusing on prevention. You helped with programs to battle substance abuse. Um, what did you learn there in that position that would inform your work in the future, Sophie? Well, I suppose there are parallels in um, that part of my career, which was um, which was fascinating as well. And the reason why I went into policing is because actually policing is just the, um, you know, right at the end of where things happen. So the police pick up the pieces of things that have gone wrong elsewhere in the system. And most people in our criminal justice system who we were, you know, coming into contact with and arresting and, you know, shunting through the system. They weren't bad people. They were sad people. They'd had sad lives. Um, you know, very many of them had experienced abuse and so wow. on as um, as children. Um, you know, very complex issues with, with these people. So my passion here really was how do we get up front of that and actually recognizing yes there are things that the police can do differently but one of the main things the police can do uh, about this is work in partnership with other agencies so uh, an area that I'm particularly passionate about is uh, violence against women and girls so um, when I'd previously been in government I'd taken through our first um, legislation in Wales on, on violence against women and girls and then was it able to go into the police and look at that? Okay, so how is that going to work in practice? And there's some really interesting stuff there. So um, we were dealing in South Wales Police uh, with 36, 36,000 incidents of domestic abuse every year. Oh, my God. With about 7,000 victims. So, you know, you don't have to be good at maths to tell you. That means that most of those 7,000 victims were victims more than once. Um, and these were just what the police knew about and there's another interesting stat which is on average and I'll say a woman it's not always a woman but still primarily it's women who experience domestic abuse um on average a woman will experience 36 incidents of domestic abuse before she reports to the police now during that time she is coming into contact with 
healthcare professionals, midwives. Um, she might be turning up at A&E. There are likely to be signs and symptoms of this in the school. There might even be opportunities where she sat in the hairdressers for two hours chatting with her hairdresser and actually what if the hairdresser had asked her, um, you know, some questions and had the ability to direct us to support. So what we did there was really to work with those other agencies to have mandatory up what we called ask and act. So when you were pregnant, and again, really terrible statistic, domestic abuse actually increases, the prevalence increases during pregnancy. Oh. Another factor back to our first thousand days, another factor which causes problems. And the madness of the system there really is, um, I don't know if you had this when you had your kids, I've had five, so I've had lots of this, but every time you go for your appointment, um, they um, they test a urine sample for preeclampsia. Mm-hmm. Um, now, actually... There's a bigger risk to women from domestic abuse than there is from preeclampsia. So why is the healthcare system not doing what it can at that point to recognise and perhaps intervene in risk? So we started building programmes. I shifted resources from policing, which, as you can imagine, not popular. So from our frontline cops into healthcare interventions to get our healthcare professionals asking and acting so that we could get to these victims before the 36th incident. And then we reformed the way in which our officers thought about, you know, what was a victim? Why does she, you know, why does she stay? Why doesn't she leave? What are all the complexities around that? We work with schools to be identifying what might be, you know, what are the signs and symptoms with kids and how could we intervene um, earlier there? We we, uh, rolled out programmes to tackle adverse childhood experiences. So that's why I was passionate about my police job, not because I was on the beat and, you know, chucking people in the back of uh, police vans and locking them up, but because actually we were trying to get up front of these issues. Well, it's a cycle too, right? Because unemployment means then you might get into substance abuse, then you might get into physical abuse. Uh-huh. So it's a cycle. So these, uh, I can see why the first thousand days appeals to you. But you know, Sophie, I cannot believe you became a commissioner at the ripe old age of 21. I mean, a counselor. What is a counselor? Just before we leave that. So a counselor is um, a representative who's elected at a local government level. So we have 22 local authorities in Wales who are responsible for running our schools, um, our parks, our highways, um, gosh, our refuge collection and a range of other um, a range of other things. So essentially it's responsible for running the city, if you like. So tell me now, you've come so far, you've gone from, you know, neighborhood council to, uh, you know, national issues to now global issues. And this has just been in one career lifetime and you still look young to me. Would you get a wrinkle? You have five children. But um, what three things would you say? We have so many business owners that listen to this podcast. What would you say to them? Uh, Let's give three reasons why they should be concerned with the future beyond their, you know, mm-hmm. tenure. Let's start with that. Three reasons why they should be concerned with the future. Um, because the the future and the here and now, they're not mutually exclusive. There are lots of things that if we um, we did them better thinking to the future, they'd also have a positive impact now. So, for example, we're all living in a kind of global energy crisis at the moment. Uh, The cost of energy and fuel and so on, and it's particularly bad in the UK, and that's really hitting people's pockets. Now, I was listening to a speech by um, our former Deputy Prime Minister back in 2010, who was talking then about renewable energy and nuclear energy interventions. And he actually said, there's no point in us investing in that now. It's going to take at least 10 years for that to come into fruition if we invest now. Well, hello, fast forward 10 years later, and actually, we would all pretty like cleaner and cheaper um, energy now. So that was a short term thinking, which has stored up those problems, which we're now living in. And we can play those out in so many ways. The next thing I would say is it's our duty to be good ancestors. It's not, um, you know, it's not the role of humans to kind of um, you know, pillage and decimate our planet. We don't own this planet. We're just borrowing it whilst we're here. And if we look 50,000 years to the past, there's been about 100 billion people who were once alive and are now dead. There's 8 billion of us on the planet at the moment. But if we look 50,000 years to the 
future, there are about 6.75 trillion people who are yet to be born. And um, what we as the 8 billion in the here and now, and you know, let's be really honest about it, a very tiny number of those 8 billion, the, the decision makers, the politicians, the global leaders, and so on, what they do will determine the futures of those 6.75 trillion. And, you know, we have to make sure that we are leaving the world um, better than we found it. And then the final thing I would say is um, this isn't going to take that long to play out. So even if you're worried about you and your immediate family, your kids, your grandkids, your nieces or nephews, um, your grandkids and pr- actually probably your kids will absolutely be paying the price. Um, look at it- look at Lahaina. Look at look at. Um- Give me another storm. Just pick one yeah, anywhere. Exactly. There's so many. Um, yeah. Now, let's, uh, you see, I keep changing my background. All the castles in Scotland. <laughs> um, I want people to learn and be inspired to go there and learn from this country. What are three things people, executives can do to really make a difference for the future? What's, what's you know, low-hanging fruit that we can all do, would you say? So I think there's something about um, testing, setting a series of goals, which are holistic goals. Now, we've got the sustainable de- development goals. I'm a fan of the SDGs. I think they're a bit complex. You know, there's 17 of them and so on. Um, you know, we brought the 17 down to seven in Wales, which is a bit more manageable. But essentially, there's something around testing everything you do against a series of, of goals. And you might make those SDGs fit for your own particular world or business or whatever it might be. But at least have a set of long-term goals, holistic goals, which are going to support um, the well-being of future generations and test everything you do there. Um, Test how you build. You know, if you're building mega spas, um, are you building in terms of, you know, carbon neutral? Are you helping to restore nature? Are you employing people in that build build and paying them a fair wage? When you're opening your facilities, um, you know, again, what are we thinking about in terms of wages? What about the accessibility to people who might be living in poverty? We should be democratising wellness and, and well-being. Uh, for the whole of society. Um, And then in terms of, you know, your business dealings, you know, how can you use the power of, you know, contracting procurement to drive change in other areas? So I think there are loads of things you can do there. But I suppose the key points, um, think long term and think how your actions affect, affect the next generation. Think in a systems way in terms of everything being connected to everything and test how you can maximize the benefits of what you do and avoid um, you know, avoid harm. I have to tell you, I've taken so many notes, like you're my college professor. I can't even, and you're not <laughs> going to test me, but I feel like you should, because it's so exciting. <laughs> so <laughs> Sophie, we're going to hear from you. I know you'll be embraced into our global wellness community, but could we end by you teaching us a couple words in Welsh that will inspire us to have hope for the future, that we can do it? Maybe even how to say we can do it. How, how do you say that? Oh, you know? my goodness. Um, <laughs> gosh, me now, we can do, oh, gosh. See, this is where, as a learner, you start getting into all this, oh, gosh, what's the correct? I am thing? learning Portuguese. Right. And I, and don't not put me on the spot. <laughs> okay, how about um, one, just a happy word in Welsh, a hopeful word. Oh, well, um, happis is happy. Um, Dovodol is future. And... Um, uh, Weld it de bottle. Look to the future. Weld de bottle. Look yeah. to the future. Weld yeah. de bottle. Okay. I'm going to write it down. I'll look it up on my Google Translate. <laughs> and then when I see you in Qatar in just a few weeks, we're going to say that to each other. Okay? <laughs> and get a wrinkle by then. Do that for me. If you care about me, you will get a wrinkle. Okay? That's <laughs> Bendy Geddig, that means fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. So great to get to know you, Sophie, and can't encourage you more to keep up the great work. Uh-huh. Thank you very much. It's been lovely chatting.